Good afternoon. Well, we're, we're trying it out. <laughs> we're making it work. There we go. Welcome to our midweek Lent service uh, this afternoon. It's good to have you with us. Um, just quickly a reminder that there are grab-and-go meals that are available for you after the service today. If you head over to the fellowship hall, uh, those will be available. And it is, you probably saw the sign as you, you uh, walked in, pulled pork sandwiches, which have been uh, smelling really good all morning, uh, macaroni and pea salad, and fresh fruit. So make sure that you grab a meal uh, on your way out if you need that for uh, lunch today. And uh, I see that we've got some folks who are kind of mostly gathered over on this side of the sanctuary. That's a good thing. I was going to actually announce that uh, we continue to have our outside air on, and today it should be a little bit better because our outside temperature is better. But you'll notice the vents for the outside air are all over on this side of the sanctuary. So if you sit on the south side, you should be a little more comfortable and a little bit further away from the cooler air, unless you would like cooler air. So that might help to uh, mitigate uh, any of the kind of temperature balances we've been, uh, that have been challenging us. I invite you into our call to worship as we begin our service today. We'll wait for a second for those words to appear on the screen. Let us worship God. Reconciled, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. We are new creations. The old has gone, the new has come. Let us worship God as Christ's ambassadors. Through us and through our worship, may we announce the good news to all. Let us worship God in spirit and in truth. Praise God, we are reconciled, redeemed, Renew. We listen now to our hymn, Canticle of the Turning. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the God of my heart is great, and my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the one who waits. You fixed your sight on your servant's plight, and my weakness you did not spurn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, could the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to churn. Though I am small, my God, my all, you work great things in me. And your mercy will last for the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame and to those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to flight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. From the halls of power to the fortress tower, not a stone will be left on stone. 
Let the King beware, for your justice tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor shall weep no more for the food they can never earn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though the nations rage from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's crushing grasp. The saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. Till the spear and rod can be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart still sing on the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Please join me in prayer. Faithful God, you renew your promises in every generation. Deepen our awareness of the communion of saints who have gone before us, the saints in our own time, and the saints who will carry on your message of grace after us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's actually the whole chapter. Paul writes, now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here ends our reading. Well, we are continuing on with our theme this Lenten uh, season. Our focus on these midweek uh, days is to talk about 
what it means that we are created for community and all the different aspects of that. And at first, this, uh, this scripture from 1 Corinthians may sound like kind of a strange passage to teach us how we are created for community, but it really has something pretty profound to offer. Now, it can be hard for us to hear the things that Paul is saying here because, well, we're Americans. And so the baggage that comes with growing up in the American culture is a fierce individualism. Now, that's not always talked about as baggage, of course. In fact, it's often thought of as a virtue to be very fiercely independent, to be able to pull ourselves up from, by our own bootstraps, to do things for ourselves, to think for ourselves, to act for ourselves. That is all considered a virtue in our culture. We talk a lot about our rights, and that can even spill over into church. And we can fall into this kind of thinking and speaking and living of asserting what we believe, that what we believe belongs to us, what actions we have a right to take and others have no right to deny us. Well, what we read today is from one of the first letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And he probably wrote it about around the years 53 to 57 AD, so there, that's how old it is. He wrote it to this church in Corinth, which was a church that he had established on his missionary journeys. Now, another letter was actually written before 1 Corinthians, but uh, we don't know where that letter is or what happened to it. So this one gets the title of first. That church in Corinth was made up largely of people who had left the Greek pagan religion and then possibly a few Jewish converts as well. And the reason that Paul is writing to them, well, it's not very good. He's writing to settle some disputes among that church. This little church had a number of them. They were divided and conflicted and seeking answers to questions they had that surrounded these conflicts. They want answers to their questions about some ethical dilemmas, how to live as Christians. But what's really at the heart of their questions and their dilemmas is this question of freedom, the freedom that the gospel of Jesus Christ has won for them. Now, one of the controversies they faced was a question about eating a certain kind of meat. So if you were listening to that passage being read, and you might have been thinking, what in the world is this really all about? This sounds very strange. Well, this question wasn't a matter of choosing, are we going to have chicken or beef for supper tonight? Or do I become a vegetarian and give up meat altogether? But much and maybe most of the meat that was available in the markets of ancient Corinth had first been offered as a sacrifice to the Greek pagan gods in their temples of worship. And not only in the markets, but sometimes you actually went to the temples and ate that meat there. Now, some of the Corinthian Christians were insisting that, well, we're Christian. There's no reason we can't eat this meat sacrificed to idols. And Paul kind of speaks these arguments that they're making back to them, and he says that in the first part of our reading. He actually agrees with their arguments. We do worship the one true God, so even though this food was offered in worship to false gods, well, we know those gods don't hold any power. We are free to eat this and not burden our own consciences. We know these things. We know these truths. But that's why Paul says at the beginning, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Yes, these concerned Corinthian Christians had a right to eat this food, even better to say that they had the liberty, they had the freedom to eat it, that would not affect their relationship with God. But there were newer Christians in their church, people who had recently come out of the pagan religion, 
and been taken hold of by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for these young in the faith people, eating that meat was an issue. They weren't quite as confident yet in their new faith. And seeing fellow Christians eating the meat could have an effect on their own faith. Which is the point Paul makes when it comes to Christian freedom. Paul points out that we are not merely individuals. Rather, we are placed by God into a community. And in that community, our actions affect others. Those others are our siblings in Christ. We are all united by Christ's death. And so it is by Christ's death that we are no longer labeled as things like weaker Christian or stronger one, but rather we are called siblings in Christ, members of the same family. And Christ died for those so-called weaker believers as much as he died for the strong ones. And so Paul calls on Christians to act not with their own rights in mind, but according to what will build up another person. Martin Luther echoed this, uh, did more than echo about it, echo it actually, many, many years later, hundreds of years later, uh, when he wrote in his essay, The Freedom of a Christian, one of his most famous quotes. And it's kind of a paradoxical statement. It's not kind of, it is a paradoxical statement that he makes. When he says this, Luther said, a Christian is a Lord of all, completely free of everything. A Christian is a servant, completely attentive to the needs of all. So in Christ, you and I are freed from the burden of thinking that anything we do wins us favor with God. God's grace claims you and me before and in spite of anything we do or anything we fail to do. And in Christ, we are freed to be pulled out of ourselves, freed to serve others for whom Christ has died. And so we do not live or have we do not live a have to life when it comes to how we relate to others and how we live toward our siblings in Christ. We do not live a have to life, but a get to life. We get to care for others and recognize our impact on them because we have been joined together by God, connected and created to be in community with one another. And so the question we ask then, and this is kind of a summary of what Paul is saying really to those Corinthians, the question we ask is not, what can I get away with? But what can I do, what do I get to do for my brother or sister in Christ? So it is not about being required to deny ourselves of exerting our rights. It is about being freed to get to act in the interest of someone else, which, when it comes down to it, is really all about grace. The grace we have all received abundantly from God. The grace we now get to live into and act out of in this community of people where each one of us has been taken hold of by Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. We listen now to O God of Mercy, God of Light. and 
your Son to die for all, that our lost world might hear your call. Oh, hear us lest we stray and fall. We rest our hope in you. far and wide, since Jesus Christ for all has died. Grant us the will and grace provide to love them all in you. And may your Holy Spirit move who live to live in love till you receive in heaven above all those who live in you. As last week, there will be a brief uh, silence after several of the petitions and our prayers this afternoon. And that's some space created for you to be able to offer your own prayers, silent or allowed, for those individual petitions uh, as we pray together. So I invite you into a time of prayer. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord, who makes every day new. And especially we thank you for the sustaining goodness of your creation. For the new creation in Christ and all gifts of healing and forgiveness. For the gifts of relationship with others. For the communion of faith in your church. Merciful God of might, Renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Today especially we pray for those who govern nations of the world. For the people in countries ravaged by strife or warfare. For all who work for peace and international harmony. for all who strive to save the earth from carelessness and destruction, for the church of Jesus Christ in every land. Almighty God, we thank you for your goodness to us and all that you have made, and we praise you for your creation, for keeping us in all things in your care, for all the blessings of life. Above all, we bless you for your immeasurable love in redeeming the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with thankful hearts we praise you, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving ourselves to your service and by living in your gifts of holiness and righteousness all our days. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace. Amen. We listen to Jesus Still Lead On. Jesus, still lead on till our rest be won. And although the way be cheerless, we will 
follow, calm and fearless, guide us by your hand to the promised land. If the way be drear, if the fall be near, let no fears or take us let not faith and hope forsake us safely past the foe to our home we go when we seek relief from the long felt grief temptations come alluring make us patient and enduring it was that bright shore where we weep no more Jesus still lead on till our rest be Heavenly leader, still direct us, still support, console, protect us, till we safely stand in the promised land. We say our sending words together. Let us go out with God's love to nurture us, with God's peace to comfort us, and with God's truth to guide us, remembering God promises to be with us always. Thanks be to God. <laughs>